think dynamically about price and do it often. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Today's podcast is sponsored by Jennings Executive Search. I had a great conversation with John Jennings about the skills needed in different pricing roles. He and I think a lot alike. If you're looking for a new pricing role, or if you're trying to hire just the right pricing person, I strongly suggest you reach out to Jennings Executive Search. They specialize in placing pricing people. Say that three times fast. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the cognitively biased relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving, and our guest today is David Falzani, and here are three things you want to know about David before we start. He is the CEO of Polaris Associates, a consulting firm, and he's been running that for 16 years. He is the professor at Nottingham University, and he's focused on sustainable wealth creation. I can't wait to hear what that actually means. And he just released a brand new book, Double Your Price, The Strategy and Tactics of Smart Pricing. Welcome, David. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of all your work and also of this podcast. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so what is sustainable wealth creation? I, I'm thinking that's me getting rich, but I'm probably not what you mean. Yeah, it's one of those interesting kind of terms, isn't it? It can mean many things perhaps to different people. So the way I interpret it, it's about finding a sustainable way for businesses to succeed. And I don't think that's necessarily just about ecology. I think it's all about the, also about the fundamentals that we know well. So things like the importance of making a positive margin, being able to create economic wealth so that that can be reinvested back into staff training, into improved services or products for the company. Um, and also, of course, the ability ultimately to generate taxes, which we all rely on, of course, to run all the services we have, you know, in our, in our societies today. So I, th I have a sort of quite holistic, broad view of what that means. But for me, it kind of covers that, that element of the entrepreneurial spirit with a view to, you know, that we want to build things that can last for a long time, essentially. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a really nice phrase because it says, hey, I want to run, I want to make smart business decisions that last a long time, not just take advantage of the short term. So, yeah, I, I think that's yes. exactly right. I think having uh, a long term view. Sorry, Mark, I interrupted you. No worries. Um, so how did you get into pricing? Yeah, so interesting question. So I, um, I've been involved with either starting or growing businesses um, for about 25 years or so, uh, both as an entrepreneur uh, and then also as a business consultant. Um, and I started working with small and medium businesses um, through some universities, so such as Oxford University and then my own university, which is Nottingham University. And what I noticed working with these, um, these small and medium businesses, you know, potential high growth businesses, is that the number one error I found, uh, you know, that they were, you know, stuck with was underpricing. So for me, the number one error I spotted was this, this just chronic underpricing and underappreciation of how they should price, the importance of price, and ultimately about having a pricing point, which is too low to really make their business sustainable, to allow them to prosper and to succeed. And so that kind of um, lit my interest, I suppose, for pricing as a topic, um, its importance. And then this, this kind of interesting, you know, where I kind of started was this observation that people seem to underestimate its importance. They don't come to review pricing often enough. Um, and, you know, I think, again, you know, we talk more about it, this, this idea about, you know, if I keep my price low, I'm more likely to survive as a business. And that seems to be ingrained. Um, and certainly something I saw uh, and still see today as being very common with um, the small and medium businesses. And that's that's the, the kind of issue that I've tried to address in the book um, and also something that I'm very passionate about and trying to spread the word and trying to fix as well. So, so do you think those are the reasons why people underpriced or um, or are there other things like they just don't understand what they could price, what they should price? Yeah, so I think there are at least three reasons um, for this this bias, this cognitive bias, this lack of kind of rational considered thinking about pricing. So I think the first reason is that many 
particularly early stage businesses, um, have a lack of confidence in their value proposition. So for me, the value proposition, I always like to summarize it as it's the thing that you do that customers value, and they value it so much that they're willing to give you money for it. And hopefully that thing is also differentiated, so different in some way and better in some way than the competition. So if they have a lack of confidence in their value proposition fundamentally, then they're more likely to think, well, a lower price is required in order to succeed in the market. The second reason is um, an associated one, which is that I think sometimes particularly CEOs have a fear that they won't have enough sales in order to cover their overheads. So they have this kind of fear that, you know, if they don't get enough sales in over the next month, the next quarter, whatever the time period is, then I won't be able to cover payroll. I won't be able to pay the salaries. Maybe I can't pay the rent on the offices. Uh, and they also have some associated belief that having a price low will alleviate that in some way, which is often a very misguided uh, view. And then I think the third and final reason that I see um, this bias in place is that companies often set price in a very irregular um, way or an irregular frequency. So they might set pr price once a year, they might do it once every few years. And once it's set, it's something that's not reviewed enough or not often enough, and perhaps not reviewed with a view as to how important and dynamic that pricing decision can be. You know, so, so that kind of very sort of like, you know, we looked at pricing, it is what it is. Now we concentrate on all those other aspects of our business, when in fact, they should be going back and re-reviewing that. So those are my three main kind of reasons about why this underpricing behavior exists. Um, so I liked all three of those. On the last one where you talked about the irregularity, I often say companies use the set it and forget it rule uh, because they just don't want to go back and revisit it. It was such a hard decision. Why would we want to make that decision again? Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely get that. I think it's a great expression to use. Um, I think um, there's a lot of um, emotional baggage there, um, particularly for uh, CEOs and directors of businesses. Um, there's a there's a fear of getting things wrong, of messing things up. Um, there's a perhaps a lack of realization that you know useful market experiments can be uh, can be can be used. They can they can be ex executed in the market. You know little experiments to test pricing decisions, and they can be done in a way that are low risk. Um, and pricing is sometimes viewed as a you know it's only it's a decision for the very highest um, levels of the management. Or uh, paradoxically, it can be the other way around, and the board of directors are not talking about pricing. They've kind of uh, uh, they've delegated it down to the middle ranking management, and and, the, and pricing never really comes up as a topic um, with the frequency or, or the magnitude of importance that it really warrants um, at the board of directors. So there's kind of two kind of uh, extremes there. But I, I've seen them both in place. So yeah, so I think I think it's an interesting um, you know phenomenon that we say, see in management today. Yeah, and I hadn't thought of this until you just brought this up. But, uh, you, you know, as pricing people, we understand behavioral op economics and prospect theory and losses loom larger, larger than gains. Imagine that you're making a decision to change prices. You either increase profit or you decrease profit. Now, if I decrease profit, I lose my job. If I increase profit, I might get an attaboy. Losses loom much larger than gains in that case. So why would I ever change my price? Yeah, yeah, that's so true, isn't it? Yeah, there's asymmetric risk for uh, for those people. So, uh, and which is why you know, and I say this in the book, I think it's really important that pricing is on the agenda for boards of directors, and it's something that they revisit regularly. You know, it's not a once a year, um, you know, event uh, or exercise. It's something they should be doing regularly. And now, how appropriate or how you know how regular should that be? Well, I think it depends, obviously, on the type of business, the dynamics, the speed or rate of change. Uh, within the environment, both on the product side, but also in terms of competition and customer behavior. Um, but I think, you know, just, you know, the message is really simple, isn't it? You're not doing it often enough, folks. You need to really be looking at it in a different way. And right. you need to be, you know, I, I always think, you know, when I work with them um, as a consultant, I say to my, my clients, I say, it should be a standing item in your agenda. Every time you have a board of directors meeting, it's there in the agenda. And, you know, you ask, you know, four or five, you know, kind of prophylactic questions around what's happening. What are we doing on pricing? What are we looking at? What have we reviewed? Yeah. Are we thinking more dynamically, more imaginatively, perhaps, about what we can do regarding our price points? So I think, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting area again. Uh, I've heard from other pricing experts, and I kind of like this thought that um, 
you should be doing a pricing project every quarter. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be changing prices every quarter, but you should be constantly looking at some pricing aspect and and saying, hey, what can we test? What should we be tweaking? Um, so I, I liked that. Yeah, I think it's a really, um, you know, it, it's a really nice idea again. Um, you know, when I when I read the book, I wanted it to be a very practical book. So in here, I put in about uh, 10 or um, 12 exercises in there that the reader can do on their own business. And they're all around the kind of um, things that you just highlighted there, Mark. So they're, you know, how do I reframe value for my business? Um, how do I produce a new, you know, have I revisited the, uh, you know, the essentials like the pricing scattergram to understand where my competitors are going in terms of their positioning on pricing? Um, have I thought about how I can add additional layers of value to my fundamental, you know, customer value proposition or USP, you know, unique selling proposition? Have I thought about the importance of emotional value? Um, and particularly, I think with manufacturing businesses, more perhaps than service businesses, there's a very sort of um, kind of like a rational, a rationalist kind of view about what it is that we do as a business, you know, that we have, we have a product and it has features. Um, and the emotional side, you know, how do we make it easier for the customer to say yes to us? How do we attach additional layers of emotional value to a product? Um, I think sometimes manufacturers are kind of slow on that because of, perhaps because of the nature of manufacturing, you've got a factory or factories to run and, you, and, you know, it's a very complex environment operationally. Um, so you tend to be perhaps a little bit more pragmatic and um, a little bit more sort of, um, you know, rationalist in terms of trying to think, well, this, this is a physical thing that we're making. Whereas, you know, all the evidence, of course, says to the contrary to that, um, markets today in Western economies are highly sophisticated. Um, human beings are very emotionally driven. Um, you know, Andrew Kahneman with Thinking Fast and Slow has just shown how irrational some of the behaviors can be around decision making about how to recognize value. And if you're not thinking on those terms, then you, you're certainly not maximizing the uh, opportunity you have as a business in terms of selling your own wares uh, and also developing, of course, new products, but also in terms of delivering customer value and getting your customers to actually be happier uh, and more engaged with you as well. Uh, and if you do that right, of course, then, then this virtuous circle comes along where you know, all of your stakeholders are more engaged, you've got happier, um, uh, healthier sort of work environment, uh, happier employees and so on. So again, it all kind of, you know, it, it's interlinked. And that's certainly one of the things that I find so fascinating about pricing. It's just this huge effect it has on all those different aspects of, of business. So of the three reasons that you gave for why companies tend to underprice, the one that resonated with me the most is by far the first one. Right. And that is that they lack confidence in their value proposition. Now, why, why can't companies understand the value they deliver to their customers and how their customers perceive that value? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think it's, I don't have a perfect answer for you. I think there are, there are a few different things that come to mind. I think one is that, you know, in the face of the customer, it's hard to have really high quality data or intelligence that you can use, you know, market intelligence to really find out what's going on in terms of decision making, about trade-offs that customers are making, about you know what really happened when you didn't get that contract, when you didn't make that sale, you know, what really happened, what were the driving factors. Um, and in this uh, environment of uncertainty, um, which by the way, I think is the best definition of entrepreneurship, you know, managing uncertainty. You know, when faced with uncertainty, I think it, it's easy to lose confidence um, in your value proposition, to lose confidence that you're actually doing things maybe in, a, in the correct way or in the optimal way. And when you start to lose confidence, then I think that that's when you start to think, well, maybe, you know, maybe price is the recovery mechanism. You know, if we go cheaper, then perhaps more customers will say yes to us, we'll win more business. Um, and, and going back to what we said earlier on, that that is very much, of course, um, a path to undermining the, um, you know, the future of your business, the sustainability of it through all the different features that pricing has in terms of, you know, protecting margins. So I think I think this, I think it's certainly this this managing uncertainty, acknowledging the environment, what it is. You know, some customers will always complain about price, whatever the price is. So realizing this, realizing that the market is not homogenous, there are different customers. Some of them, let's say, are premium customers in terms of a pricing outlook. Others are price shoppers. You know, they're very price sensitive um, and everywhere in between on that spectrum. And getting companies to understand, well, where do you want to sit on that spectrum? What qualifies you to get you engaged with that part of the market? 
Um, and do you really want to be, you know, chasing, you know, people who are, you know, I don't want really, to, you know, sometimes the expression bottom feeders is used, but it's a little bit uncharitable perhaps. But this idea about very price sensitive um, shoppers, um, is that a market you really want to be chasing? Is that somewhere you can survive long term? Can you prosper? Um, other ways that you can differentiate and move yourself up that value ladder um, to serve the more sort of uh, attractive and more premium customers. Yeah, as I was listening to you speak, one of the things that comes to mind is that I rarely hear a company willing to walk away from a piece of business. And and that almost drives exactly what we're talking about. Because if you can't look at a bottom feeder or a super price sensitive customer and say, look, that's just not my customer, then you're going to be chasing price all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I try to make an, a, a really simple example in my book. I talk about company A and company B. And company A has a price, uh, which I got a benchmark at 100, most round number. And company B has got a higher price. The price is 130. Now, company A, maybe because of that lower price, it has a higher conversion rate of leads to sales uh, compared to company B. And then in the book, I ask, and this is an exercise straight out of my, my seminars I've done with small and medium businesses. But then I ask them, well, which one do you think is more profitable? Do you think it's company A with a lower price and a much higher conversion rate? So their conversion rate, I think, was 60%. Or is it company B? They've got a 30% higher price, but their conversion rate is only 40%. And of course, People, you know, say, well, there's not enough information. I said, okay, you know, assume average margins, you know, industry standard margins, you know, and people tend to be a sort of three quarters in the camp of A is the superior, more profitable business. And the answer, of course, is, is company B. And company B wins less business, but it's far more profitable. It's actually twice as profitable in company A, um, again, using average margins and so on. Um, and people kind of don't get that initially. They really have to think about that before they understand. The company A is... And many businesses are like this, Mark, absolutely. They are, I call them busy fools. You know, they're running around, they're, they're, they're working really hard for their customers, but they're not really making any money. They feel lucky they're breaking even. Company B, less busy, but much better margins, much more profitable. More time to sit back, to reflect on how they're generating value, uh, more healthy, more generous budgets to reinvest into staff training, into product and service development. Um, and I sometimes see this with, with clients or, or associates I've worked with. I've worked sometimes with um, a chain of restaurants um, and I go and visit the restaurants and it's really busy and it's and everyone's running flat out, but they're not making any money. And, and, and the challenge I set them was, well, can you move yourself up slightly in the market so that you've got less, you're less busy. And I promise you, you'll make a lot more money than you would be just running around like a, like a sort of mad, you know, mad person. So, um, so yeah, so I think, you know, this, this idea about you can be less busy, you shouldn't be fearful of that, as long as you're happy that you're making great margins. And that is a much yeah. easier place to be in many, in many regards. Yeah, the story that you just told uh, reminds me of Android versus iOS or Apple, where Android has, what, 72% worldwide market share in mobile phones, and Apple makes 85% of the profit in mobile phones. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Apple's just a fantastic example of pricing um, and this relationship between pricing and, and value and understanding customer value. Because, uh, you know, as, as we all know, they tend to occupy the premium price slots in every category that they, they compete or choose to compete in. Um, last time I looked, and it's probably been six months, last time I looked, I think Apple had something like $300 billion in cash and cash equivalents on their balance sheet, which is roughly, I think, three times that of the Federal Reserve. So Apple are just insanely, uh, you know, accomplished at understanding these trade-offs. As you say, you know, who are the premium customers? Where can we make money? And if we do it well, then we can invest in all those fantastic other elements of the value proposition. You know, it's not just about having a phone or a tablet or a computer. It's about how do we make our customers feel better? How can we attach emotional value to that? And, um, yeah, they're absolutely... You know, kings, if you if you will, of the, of the B to C um, you know, model of how to do that, and um, you know they, they seem to be uninterrupted in their ability to do, do this now for, for decades, uh, which is quite an accomplishment. So, David, I've loved our conversation so far, but I was saving this for the end because I really want to talk about the exercise you use with companies, and you say, "What would it look like if you doubled your price?" So, so tell us about the exercise, and then I want to hear some of the experiences you've had. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I love talking about this. So why double your price? 
So I set it as quite a provocative challenge to some of the audiences that I was uh, engaged with in training. So small and medium businesses, but also sometimes larger organizations. Um, and I'd be delivering um, you know, sales and marketing training to them. And I would say to them, well, can you double your price? And what I really was saying, is there a safe ring fenced experiment you can run in the market where you double your price? And I promised them, if you do this, if you're actually able to do this in a safe manner, again, we don't want to throw the, the business away through, it, through some sort of mad, you know, uncontrolled experiment. But if you're able to do this in a controlled way, I promise you will learn something really interesting about your business, something you did not know before. And if you're able to do it, um, it could be you can actually transform your business um, by, by, by nature of these, these you know, things that you were discovering, these incredible um, breakthroughs. So to my surprise and delight, having made this quite provocative and you know, by design provocative um, challenge to my audience, some of these businesses actually did it. They went out there and literally, some of them actually literally doubled their prices. So one example was a business who was working in the middle sort of um, Midlands, so the middle region of uh, the United Kingdom. And they were, I think, a video services business. And they were expanding. They were doing okay. But they wanted to move into the Southeast market and London in particular, of course, the capital city. So what they said was, any business that we book or, or, or book or, or, or bid for within the, the motorway system, the freeway that goes around the whole of London, so within that geographical area, any business in that area, we will double our price list. Now, to their astonishment, they found that it made no difference to their conversion rate. So the percentage conversions they got from leads to clients was the same. But of course, from a profit point of view, their profits increased something like eightfold. So what they've done is they found a really, a really neat, safe way. So this is a market they were moving into. They weren't going to damage or risk their existing business. It was a new market, and they, 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 they repositioned themselves. And what they learned over the following few months was that they had been very much addressing, we call them earlier, you know, bottom feeders or the price-sensitive end of the market. And because of that, they were seen as being too cheap by the premium customers. And by doubling their price, they suddenly became uh, eligible, let's say, for those more premium uh, customers who now look to them with a different view. And so they started booking this business at a much higher margin, uh, and that helped them grow enormously. So they grew, I think, fivefold over the following two or three years. They found that they'd been chronically underpricing everywhere in all of their markets. Uh, now, they didn't double their price in those other markets, but they went up progressively 10 or 15, 20% in several steps. Um, and they found that they um, you know, had an entirely new paradigm. You know, they, had, they had money to spend, to reinvest, to grow, they had time that they could pause and not be, you know, busy fools, not running around all the time. And so this has happened a few times now. You know, well, actually, many times, businesses come to me and say, "Well, we tried to experiment, David. We found a safe, ring-fenced way to, to do that. Well, maybe, maybe double. Maybe it's a fifty percent increase. Maybe it's a twenty percent increase. But all of those numbers, we, you might, we, we know, and I'm sure the audience will know, have a transformative, an enormous effect on the bottom line, and the ability to generate more cash and profit to reinvest back into that." Into that virtuous circle to build the businesses. So the way that businesses tend to do these um, little experiments is maybe they maybe they go into a new territory they haven't gone into before, so they can go in and, and start with a brand new um, set of price points. Perhaps they do it by launching a parallel product line. So they um, ape or copy their existing product line, but they rebrand it. They give it a different bundle of messages and perhaps associated emotional value and a much higher price point, and then they see what happens. Um, there are various other ways that the companies can do these experiments, and I, I detail them a little bit more in the book. And again, these are these are things that companies have come and told me works for them. It's not me me creating them. I've been collecting all of these stories from the businesses that have been running these experiments. But if you're able to do it, it's a fantastic thing because I don't think anyone who's actually run the, one of these experiments has come back and said, well, we didn't learn anything. Every single one has learned something really interesting about their customers, about their value proposition, about the way that they're perceived, and, and so on. So, so yeah, so double your price, a, uh, a provocative challenge, uh, but an interesting one. I actually think the concept is fascinating and having people think through, even go try it. Um, you're right. They're going to learn a lot, but, but I think it refocuses their mind on what's the value we're delivering to which customers. So can we do market segmentation? Can we find the right mix of customers who are willing to pay more or who value the best things that we have? Um, I think it's just an absolutely brilliant strategy or brilliant uh, exercise. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, there, there is a double your price light version, 
which is um, for those who are unable, um, for whatever reason, to run the actual experiment in the market, is to do the thought experiment. So the light version of W price, which again I cover in the book, is where you, you ask your, your management team, um, what do we have to do in order to justify a literal doubling of our price? Another way of thinking about that, what would have to be in place in terms of the customer perception of the product, about the suite of, of messages, you know, the communication messages associated with the product, maybe some of the physical or, or functional aspects of the product or service as well. But what, would, what would that look like? So don't worry about how you would do it, but answer the question of what would it look like in order to justify with your current sort of understanding of the market, that double price. And then having done that, if you're able to do that, then of course you can work backwards and say, well, okay, so this is really interesting. Let's unpick that, let's unpack it a little bit more and understand, well, maybe there are ways that we can actually execute portions or, or who knows, perhaps all of that as well. So there is the thought experiment version as well for those who are less capable or able or people perhaps without the appetite to actually run the real market experiment itself. A little more risk averse, yes. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so if you were guessing, what percent of that 100% price increase could could most companies get away with without really changing their business? So that's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, I think it depends on the nature and the type of business that it is. Um, I always think that there's an interesting view of the market. I mean, we can, we can use different typographies, different frameworks to try to assess, um, you know, strategic decision making to think of well, how can we improve businesses from a price point of view i think there's a very simple way of thinking about sort of a class uh, products and services b class and c class and a class ones is where customers tend to give them the most scrutiny in terms of you know how sharp is the price how much are we bidding the price down um how how aggressive is the customer in terms of um you know price negotiation and price discovery um b Products or services would be in the middle. And then the C tend to be, and they might only be 5% of the annual spend of a big corporation, but the C tends to be the one that has very little or no scrutiny. So I think it depends where you are in terms of the um, products or services that you're delivering. But certainly if you're in the C uh, category, I think rather than price, other things are far more important, such as just ease of purchase. You know, if, you're, if you just make it easy for customers, then it's quite possible to increase you know, your, your, your set point your, your your price point by 100 um, percent and people do it all the time you go to amazon you go to ebay um, and i realize they're b2c not b2b but you see the same tactics being used where you've got basically the equivalent products being sold over multiple price points um, i realize i haven't asked answered your question mark but if i was to give you a number then i think you know for businesses that are not selling into um you know categories that are under you know incredible levels of scrutiny and detail then i think certainly five to eight percent is achievable without any problem. Um, and I think in a way, the inflationary environment we're in now is kind of like a new opportunity because now customers are resigned to the fact that prices are changing and moving because they have to, because essentially money has become less valuable. So in a way, that's opened the door um, to actual perhaps more price movement for those willing and able to, um, to spot the, the opportunities and to ex execute them correctly. I, I asked the question, question because I was thinking, how much money do companies actually leave on the table just by poor pricing? Skip all the rest of it, right? Just by poor pricing. And uh, and you're thinking on average five to 10%. And that seems pretty reasonable, right? It might even be higher than that. Uh, but but that's that seems like it's, a, like it's a pretty reasonable number. Yeah. I, mean, I had a, a company I was working with the other day uh, they raised their prices on one of their products by 180%. And it had no impact on sales, right? Yeah, I mean, no, no impact on unit volume. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there are um, definitely opportunities for, um, well, well, put it the other way around. There are definite uh, occurrences and opportunities where businesses just are chronically underpriced. They just don't understand the value associated and the value derived. Um, I think there's a couple of things we can use to help um, business leaders, particularly small and medium businesses, you know, really understand this and understand the potential. One is um, to point out existing categories where products that are essentially identical functionally are sold at vastly different price points. Um, 
And we can do this for, uh, you know, for washing powders, we can do this for cosmetics, we can do this for um, gen generic drugs like painkillers, like paracetamol or ibuprofen. Um, my favorite example is table water, so bottled water. You think about bottled water, you know, it's an H2O molecule, right? So it's, it's two hydrogens and, and one ox oxygen bonded together. Um, and the H2, H2O molecule on a $25 bottle of water is the same molecule as in the 50 cent bottle of water. Um, and yet, uh, we have these vast price differences. Um, so I, I did a, a scattergram that I, I love to, to show people, which is, you know, looking at the cost per milliliter of non-sparkling, so, so natural table mineral water um, sold through one supermarket. And there's a range of about 600% price difference between the cheapest and the most expensive per unit volume of water. Now, the water is the same, right? It's the same H2O molecule. There can be no differences. The only differences, or the biggest differences, of course, are in the packaging, the branding, and the associated messages that go with it. And I always think that's a great example to try to highlight, you know, this, this, this sometimes, you know, people just don't think about pricing in those terms. And I try to reset those assumptions that people have, some of those beliefs, some of the kind of uh, myths that people have. So one of the fundamental myths, of course, is that if I have a higher price, I'll sell less. This, this belief of, um, you know, price elasticity of demand, which I always argue is not terribly useful in modern, you know, sophisticated, differentiated products and services today. You know, it's great if you're doing commodities, but I think it's far less useful today. So I think that's one kind of way of um, trying to reset those assumptions is by saying, well, hey, you know, explain this. Why is this H2O molecule being sold at such vastly different prices? Um, and uh, hopefully we can kind of get them out of their current sort of frame of thought into thinking much more dynamically about those pricing opportunities. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great. David, I could have this conversation all day, but we are out of time. Let me ask you the final question. Um, what is one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? I think there's, um, I think we've kind of said it already, but let me say, because I think it is perhaps the number one uh, piece of advice, which is you know, think dynamically about price and do it often. So I think the frequency of revisiting your pricing decisions um, and every time you revisit it, maybe look, do something different. Use a different piece of analysis. Don't just go and revisit the same comparison to competitors or, 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 your, or, or you know, if you're using cost plus, which I hope you're not, that's a, perhaps a discussion for another day. Um, then, you know, think about, you know, the frequency at which you're reviewing those pricing decisions. That would be perhaps my number one piece of advice, because I think the more you look at pricing, the more questions that are raised, the more you start to educate yourself about your own customers, your clients, the market, competitors, and all those dynamics. So I think that's perhaps the single thing that everyone can start doing today that would produce that, that series of breakthroughs that we want them to find. I think that's absolutely brilliant because I don't think we ever truly know that we're priced correctly. And so we can always do more research, more, more thinking. There's something else we can go do. So, David, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? One of the uh, great advantages of my uh, name, uh, David Falzani, particularly the surname, is that it's so unusual. So you can Google me and you can find me very easily um, either on LinkedIn or through my various blogs or indeed through the University of Nottingham. Excellent, David. We appreciate that. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? Um, and finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. Thanks again to Jennings Executive Search for sponsoring our podcast. If you're looking to hire someone in pricing, I suggest you contact someone who knows pricing people. Contact Jennings Executive Search.